Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Now, this word for die in Greek is apothnesko. Apo Thnesco. Apo is apart from. So you are departing, basically, right? Departure. So to die, Apo Thnesco, it is mentioned 111 times in the New Testament. It's a 111. If you, if you see the numbers 111 and you wonder why you might be seeing the number, the numbers 111, three ones side by side, like I see the number 11 all the time and I've explained why. But if you see 111, um, there might be something in here for you because it means to die. And um, is dying a bad thing or is dying a good thing? We can talk about that a little bit as we go, but, but the, it says it's appointed for man to die once. And when I read that, my mind automatically goes to Um, are we talking the day that I exit out of my body? That kind of death where they take my body, bury it in the ground or whatever they do? Um, or are we talking about a different type of death to die once? Because I know in the New Testament, I've read die to yourself. I don't know how many times we have died, right? We've died with Christ on the cross. And we were raised with him. Um, so what kind of death are we talking about? You know, I've, I've, I've heard this scripture used, this Bible verse used um, for, uh, the, to, for people like when I was a Jehovah's Witness. I remember they would talk about um, people that believe in reincarnation and what an um, awful belief that is. And because it doesn't go along with the Bible, because if you look in the Bible, it says it is appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. And it's like they they took it really literal, you know, the day that you die. But now after coming out of religion in in every form, really, I mean, I call everything religion when when you um, have to um, have men as your teachers and helpers instead of the Spirit of God that's in you, teaching and helping you to what? To change your mind, to see things differently, change your view, separate yourself from the, the, the thinking that is in the air, you know, of, of the majority, but thinking outside of the box, right? It's thinking outside of the box. And when I started thinking outside of the box of religion, And uh, coming out of the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses and then seeing that, you know, there's not a whole lot of difference with people out there that are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they see things in a box that they're put in, whether it's political or whether it's religious or even if they say it's just spiritual, whatever. There's this like, there's this box, this container that they can't break free from as long as you think within these walls you're okay. And my, my heaven is an open window, by the way, it's an open window. If you ever see the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is He, um, it is a picture of an open window and it, it's not a closed window. It's actually a picture, a drawing of an open window. And, uh, so I don't, I, 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 I and that, and that fifth letter, by the way, is the letter for grace, for grace. Hey, grace. That's where the word chesed and the other word hen in Hebrew come from, comes from he, which is grace. And so five, that's why when you hear five is the number of grace, it's true. Grace is favor, favor that you don't earn or work for. It's favor. God just is for you because love is for you. God is love. Love is for you. Love is who you are. Love is on your side. So I, I live in that open window of God's love, which is grace. He's for me. We're not separate. You know, my spirit is joined to the spirit of God. We're one spirit. 
So I'm just trying to figure out things in my mind, in my mind realm, you know, and, and dissolve myself from things that um, I, I've been holding on to that, I, that aren't useful for me any longer. Things that maybe they're identities that I've labeled to myself, right? A false identity that's not of love. And so you dissolve these things. Your mind changes. Anyway, so dying once, going back to this dying once, and, and even even talking about reincarnation, you know, um, reincarnation, What what's that mean? To re-enter um, into, in, in a body, reincarnate. Carnate, car, carnate comes from the word carne, which is flesh. So it means to enter into flesh. Like, like there is the... Um, Yeshua, Jesus, um, he came in the flesh. So you could say he carnated, right? He entered into the flesh, came into this world. Um, he, it says he's going to come back again. Will he reincarnate being born of a, a woman again and, and being brought back in this world? Well, well, Yeshua actually took his body with him when he, uh, when he returned to his home. That was uh, not on earth. Right, but he's coming back to earth. He resides in us in spirit, but he took his body with him, and his body was different this time. And it's a body that you and I are waiting to um, to receive as well. It's stored up in us. It's just this thing's going to come up. It's going to come out of us, right? And uh, Yeshua, he was raised in an immortal body that didn't obey the technical laws of what we call laws here in physics and science here on earth, right? Because um, the laws say that you're a solid ob object and you can't move through a wall being a solid object. But um, these guys, they're all hanging out in a room with all the doors closed and um, suddenly Yeshua appears in that room. How'd he do that? This is after his resurrected body, when he when he returned in a resurrected body, right? Um, how did he do that? There were there were things that he could do when he came back when he when he came back from from his death, um, resurrected. He appeared to many that they they didn't recognize him. Why why didn't they recognize him? Jehovah's Witnesses have an answer for that. Well, because it, Jesus was actually Michael the Archangel, and Michael the Archangel um, just chose to appear different ways, you know, so that people would know he was back, but, you know, he didn't look like Jesus. Well, the thing is, Ye Yeshua had the ability to, if he could go through walls, he could change how he looks, right? There, there's people that, that have um, witnessed the things in the sky that they call UFOs and watched these things shapeshift. And there's people that have experienced what's called shapeshifters on the earth, skinwalkers, um, Sasquatch beings. Uh, there, there's entities people have seen that they have said they've seen them shapeshift, right? Now, you think the risen Christ couldn't take that body that he was in and and just by thought change the shape of what that physical body looks like come on you guys got to think outside the box right we 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 have no idea i mean we're, we're, we're when we think inside of a, a box we have no idea um what we're in store for so anyway um there's a word called karma and uh I was looking up the meaning of it, and it's basically the summing up. S to sum up means when you add everything together. It's the summing up of all of the, your actions, right? The things that you've done in this world. And so here in Hebrews, you've got the writer saying that it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. And people that take that die once thing um, as far as literally when you die and step out of your body, well then explain that to Lazarus because he died once and if he died once then that doesn't that mean that he doesn't it mean that he received a judgment? He died. Yeshua said Lazarus died. Now, and he went and raised him from the dead. Now 
if Lazarus had already died when he got raised back, what happened? Did he um, did he have to die again? Did he die again? Did he? How, how long did he live after he was raised from the dead? Or is he still here on earth? Did he get caught up into the heavens like Elijah and Enoch? Did he get raptured up? What about after the death of Yeshua when there was a great earthquake? And the Bible says that all of these bodies that had been buried had come up out of the ground and they were raised from the dead, these Old Testament saints. They were raised up, walked around. People, people saw them with their own eyes. Those guys had died. Now they're raised up. What happens to them? They died once, then the judgment. Did they die again? Did they get raptured? Are they still here on earth? What's the answer? See, that's that's what I I'm just asking things. I I don't, you know, I I'm just somebody that's curious and I like to think outside the box and I also like to understand why people um uh, believe in certain things like karma or reincarnation or any of that instead of just hearing from the Jehovah's Witnesses, "Hey, that's bad. You shouldn't even look into it." or hearing from anybody else saying, "That's bad. You're not allowed to look into it." What do you mean I'm not allowed to look into it? I want to understand why people believe certain things and I want to know what it is. Where did they get that from? Is it all bad or did they get it from the Bible or did they get it from a different source? Is it, but is it kind of the same thing? Because when I read Hebrews and it says, it's a point for man to die once and after that comes judgment. Well, there's a lot of people that have experienced what's called near death experiences. And, um, and I've listened to a bunch of them and they're very fascinating to listen to for me. You know, I'm not saying every single one is spot on truth. I'm just, no, I just listen. I want to hear people's testimonies. So I hear a lot about, um, uh, from so many of these guys that they, when they, when they came out of their bodies, um, they experienced a life review where they saw every thing that they had done in life, what they said to people, how it affected others, how it affected themselves, the ripple effect, how it affected one person and that, whether it was good or bad, whether you were hurting somebody or giving to somebody, whatever it is, you just see everything plainly as it is. Now, this is like a judgment when you're there to see everything about your life. Now, the one thing that they all say is that it wasn't to condemn them. I'm not saying every single one of them say, because there's some that said that they experienced, you know, hell and all this stuff. I don't hear that very often, but um, that's for a different, that's a, for a different video. But but what I'm saying is most of the ones I've heard, they say it, it's not a condemning judgment. It's just you seeing everything for what it really truly is. And so there's a judgment. You know, I think when we hear the word judgment, we think of judgment meaning something that's condemning. But there's, no, ju judgment doesn't mean condemn condemning. If you take a bite of cake right now, right, and you say, oh, this tastes great, you just made a judgment about the cake, right? You, you made a decision. You were telling um, your verdict about the cake. A judgment is a verdict, right? It can be of guilt. It could be of innocent. It's many things, right? So anyway, so I think we got to change our minds about what judgment is in, in, in the Bible because it comes from this Greek word, dikahiosune, which it, it just means it, it's a verdict. It could be innocent. It could be guilt. It could be this tastes great. This tastes awful, you know, but it, it's and, and, and who's to say, you know, the judgment, maybe part of that judgment that you have comes from yourself. Like, well, like a lot of people try to vindicate themselves and a lot of people try to condemn themselves, right? We condemn ourselves all the time, but we try to justify ourselves all the time as well, right? So perhaps it's also the way that we've been judging ourselves. But if I think this taste, this cake tastes great, and then you taste it and you think it's awful, who's right? Who's wrong? Huh? It was a judgment call you made for yourself. And if you're trying to tell others that you, they got to make the same judgment call you did because your judgment call is righteous and theirs isn't, well, guess what? That makes you a judge. And you're judging in the way that Yeshua says not to. Um, let me share something with you in uh, Ecclesiastes.
that I was reading, speaking of near-death experiences, because another thing that I heard from so many near-death experiencers that I've never, ever heard a pastor, preacher, anybody ever talk about, I've never heard it, maybe you have, I've never heard anybody talk about this, it's in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I had read the Bible before in the past, from front to cover, from back, from from Revelation to Genesis, from Genesis to Revelation, and I've probably read this scripture and just passed it by because I didn't really understand what it meant. I thought it was just poetic. But now I'm like, wait a minute. It's a, now Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, he's talking about what happens before somebody dies. And in verse 6 of chapter 12, this is where he's talking about um, what happens before somebody dies. Um, it says in, uh, in verse verse. Six, before the silver cord is snapped, before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. A cistern is a pit or a well. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Now, so he's talking about, hey, no matter what in life, you know, there's going to come the day where the dust, which we are made of, returns to the earth. So he's talking about your body. But he also talks about your spirit because he says, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Well, even Yeshua cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's like Yeshua was in complete control of his death. But here's the thing. It says before the silver cord is snapped. Now, I don't want to go over the golden bowl as much as I would like to. The golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. Um, the, those things are just things I need to meditate on, all of it, honestly. But the silver cord is snapped. Solomon was downloaded with so much wisdom, and he saw things. And this is something that he saw that I've only heard from, from near-death experiencers. And that is something about a silver cord that is attached to people. And I can't tell you how many people I've heard that have experienced this. I mean... I mean, Paul wrote about somebody that he says 14 years ago, they were caught up into paradise. He called it the third heaven. And he, he said he saw things that, that were just, you couldn't put into words. And I, I'm wondering if this man also noticed that there was a silver cord attached to him because there's a bunch of these near-death experiencers that notice like a silver cord. Just like, you know, when you're a baby and you're attached to your mother, before they detach you from her, you have what's called an umbilic umbilical cord that's that connects you to the mom. And I'm wondering if this silver cord that these people see that's attached to them is what keeps them in, in this realm here on earth still attached to their bodies. And if that, that cord is snapped or cut, as the scripture says, then you completely exit out. Once it's cut, you're out. But the people that have had the near-death experiences, and most of them call them a near-life experience because they see what life truly, truly is, that this world here is the, the delusion and that the other realm, what we might call heaven, um, is the reality right? It's just like, um, have you, you know, you heard the Bible verse where God created man in his image. Well, how about earth was created in heaven's image? Yeshua himself said in prayer, um, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's almost like to say that this earth is a reflection of the things in heaven, but here on earth, it's, it's not the perfection of heaven. Because something was changed here, right? We want a heaven on earth, and it is in, in the Bible where heaven and earth will become one. Like, like earth is going to put on a heavenly glory. Just like when, you're re when you are in your spiritually glorified body like Yeshua is, 
um, your body, your earth is going to put on heaven. You understand? So earth was created in the image of heaven. So heaven, you, are there animals in heaven? Are there dogs? Are there cats? Oh yeah, but it's on a whole different level than what you see here. Here they age, there's pain, there's all this sickness, there's this, you know, sadness, loss, but there it doesn't exist, right? So, so maybe that silver cord is something that these experiencers see that is biblical, not new age, not this, not that. It's actually biblical. Is karma biblical? Well, you might not say it because you're whatever, Christian, Jehovah, whatever you are, but, but, and you think it's bad because it's a, it's a teaching that doesn't come from your, uh, your, your, whoever you follow, your Christians you follow, but is it biblical? Well, in the Bible, you got this thing called the law. And the law has what's called reaping and sowing. I'm going to drive. I got to get going. Um, the, law, the law is you reap what you sow, right? In fact, it, it, it's so much where not only do you reap what you sow, um, you pay back uh, more than what you've taken, right? I mean, it's kind of like that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth type thing. But you, you take something from somebody, you kill their animal, you better be paying five animals back or so, right? So, it's, but, it, but it's kind of like this law of reaping and sowing. You get back what you give. So, you sow, you sow, you sow a tornado, you get back the whirlwind in full. That kind of thing. Yeah, right? You plant chaos. In return, you get double portion of chaos. So it's this law of reaping and so, uh, of, plant, of planting and, um, and um, uh, reaping, right? Sowing means to plant. Reaping means to, uh, to pull out or to take what, you, uh, what, what has grown from your labors. Right, so karma is kind of like this uh, collection of everything you've done in life, and it's almost like what I hear from people that say they get a life review, and even in the Bible it talks about this thing that after you die once, um, there's a judgment. Now, when I see that word die uh, and dying once, for me, that's not... Um, the physical death where you actually exit out of your body, where your body returns to the dust, your spirit returns to God who gave it. God is love, your spirit is love, so your spirit just, it's home. Always was love, always is love, it's home. Because love is home. In spirit, you're home. You're already home. You're already home. I know here we're waiting to go home, but you're already home. That's how you can be seated in the heavenlies at all times, because you're already there, right? Um, we just aren't aware of it because we're, we live in this matrix. But um, we're also somewhere else at the same time in spirit. But our spirit can be everywhere because your spirit is immeasurable. The spirit of God is everywhere always, right? But we, ha we contain that spirit in our soul, and then our soul brings that spirit into the body, right? Your body, your body and your spirit joining together, that's what your soul is. It's, you know, when God breathed into Adam, he spirited Adam and Adam became a living soul. The soul contained, it's a container, right? It's kind of like a glue that holds your spirit and your body together. Maybe it has something to do with this silver cord attachment. Maybe that's something that's uh, that's joined to the soul, that umbilical cord. So if your soul, if, if you do leave the body, now, whoop, there goes, you know, you, you exited out of your body. Now your body's just dust. So your soul and spirit join together, return, return to the, right, return to God. Because your soul has your mind realm in it, your thinking realm and all that. Right? 
the consciousness, if you want to say that word. I know a lot of people have a problem with that word, but conscious means to be aware that you exist, right? That's why when God says, I am, you're, you're hearing his consciousness speak out, aware of that he be. So I'm not saying, hey, I, um, I'm not saying that watch out, you're going to experience karma. Just like I'm not saying watch out, you're, you, you live under a law. The thing I want to share with you guys is, you know, when you're a believer, um, a believer, you know, a lot of people call themselves believers. I would prefer to say a, a knower. Um, a knower as far as like intimacy, knowing so intimately. It's a Greek word, gnosko. It's a Hebrew word, yada. It, it's an intimacy where I don't have to believe, you know, because believing almost sounds like, um, well, that, did that mean if I have to believe that I actually started out an unbeliever and now I got to believe? Well, where do I go from that? Is there a place I can go from there? How about just knowing? How about, how about going from knowing to just being? Just be, right? You call yourself a human being. How much of a human being are you compared to how much of a human doing are you? And maybe, we, maybe that's what this life review or this judgment is all about, to see, um, to see what a human doing we've been. But what if during this review, you don't have to relive the experiences of how you hurt everybody, all, all these people around you, animals, whatever it is, and, and, and hurt yourself? What if that part was erased from you because you trust your faith, you believed, we'll use that word believe, you believed in what Yeshua did for you. Because he did not come to destroy this law, right? Which includes reaping and sowing, or even if you want to say karma, right? Where you're going to get, you're going to pay for what you've done. Because under law, you pay for what you've done, but then um, instead of you paying for it, you have to bring a sacrifice. with you. If you read the book of Hebrews, you'll see that the priests had to bring sacrifices for themselves to offer up to God. Because they they had to keep on bringing animal sacrifices. Because even the priest couldn't say he was el perfecto. But Yeshua entered into a, a temple bringing himself. He's the sacrifice. And if you believe in him, you put your trust and faith that he was the sacrifice for this karma, if you will, or the sacrifice that the law demanded. Well, so now you go from, he didn't come to destroy or abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. So if he didn't destroy the law, is the law still active? Well, it's active for those that choose to live under it still. And even if you say, well, I don't live under any law. Well, guess what? You live under laws no matter what. Even I live under a law. I call that law love. Why is it a law? Because I better do it? No, because God is love. And if I'm one spirit with him, I am love. So the law is that I am love. So be love because you are love. Don't just show or express it. Be it. And if you be it, then you can express it. Right? If I'm one spirit with the Lord, like Paul wrote about, and then John also says, as he is, so are you. And if you read the context, he's talking about love. And Yeshua said, God is love. And if your life is hidden with Christ in God, who is love, you are love because your life is love. That is your spirit, your love. My law is to live who I am, love, the law of love. Do you understand? But in, if you're living somewhere, you live under laws of man, right? So no matter what, people are under some type of a law. And maybe, and maybe when people 
see these these things, uh, you know, this judgment stuff um, that they, they call whatever they've done, whether it was good or bad or whatever. You know, well, I know in Scripture it says, I will remember your sins no more. Now, what sin is, is it's it means... Um, it, it, it means to miss the bullseye in Greek. It's a, a word, hemartia, and it means to miss the bullseye, to miss the mark or the bullseye. What's the mark? The mark is the bullseye, dead center on the target. And if you're just off by a little, you missed it. So what is sin? Sin, sin is actually the, um, the mindset of separation from God. It's a separation right? That you're not joined to him as one. You're separate. So what must you do to become one? Well, now you think you got to karma your way to it. You got to work your way to it. You got to prove it. You got to do something. When actually that's not because there's a different law. It's the law of grace, which is coupled with love. Grace is that open window. Uh, it's favor. So I went from living under separation in my mind from God to now saying, no, um, I live in favor. But the thing is, you got voices that come against you. And they're very religious voices, right? The religious voices are the, the most condemning voices there are. And, um, and that's the problem because when the religious voices tell you you're separate from God because your works aren't proving that you're joined to God as one, well, the problem with that is they're doing worse than, than anybody else because the religious voices claim to know God intimately and then they, they say they speak for God and they condemn you. And they can't do that unless they're condemning themselves. So even your most religious people, they, they, if they are condemning, they're saying, well, I'm just reading Bible. I'm just reading Bible. I'm just quoting the Bible. Well, no, no, no they are self-condemned inside as well because they wouldn't dare condemn you if they were honest with themselves. It's like that thing that Yeshua said, you know, you, you look for the speck in somebody else's eye when you got a log in your own. I don't have a log in my eye. What are you talking about? I don't even have a speck. Ah, you're looking for a literal log, aren't you? You don't understand what Yeshua was saying. You can actually have that log removed and let Yeshua carry that log for you, which he did, a real big, heavy, giant log. So I don't want to carry a log around in my eye looking for the little speck in others, right? I'd rather be log free and, and, and not point to the speck in somebody else's eye. But see things like, wow, you know what? I have no right to judge. I have no right to condemn. Because I know, I know what I've done in my flesh. I've known what, I know the things that I've done. I know all my deeds. And if I have to pay for my, my actions, if I had to pay through karma or through the law, oh man, I, the, I, there is, what am I going to do? What am I going to do to justify myself? I cannot. I need to live by God's grace. I need grace. And you know, grace, according to Scripture, according to the writings of Paul, is uh, hooper parasuo in Greek. It's super abounding. It's overflowing. That's why when you see the drawing of grace in Hebrew, that letter He, it's an open window. Grace is always flowing and it overflows. Can't stop it. So I don't live under a law of karma. I don't live under a law of God, of the Bible, right? The Old Testament laws and rules and commandments. I don't live under that because Yeshua, he didn't destroy it. So you can choose to live under it and get the consequences of it and, um, and have fun with that. Or you can say, Yeshua did it for me and let that be written on your heart and don't let it go.
And don't let anybody change your mind about that either, that he did it for you. And then if you do actually step out of this body sometime in your life, whether that silver cord is still attached or whether it is snapped, I think your review is going to be wonderful. And you're going to know why you're getting that review and why it's so wonderful. That you're going to go to your knees, not, not to worship because you better. You're just going to go to your knees because you cannot contain standing up. Because of how overwhelmed with joy you are. That God's grace was so abounding for you in your life. That Yeshua took away that condemning judgment, that condemning review. Right? Because you might see it as condemning. If you see how you hurt somebody, you might get in fear and say, Oh no, does this mean I'm going to hell? Does this mean God said, I, you know, you, you might, you might just see it as is just, even if in the review, you, you saw all of it, the good and the bad, but you would be confident because love would be there the whole time, never leaving you. Knowing that this was just the way it was. This is the truth. This is what happened, right? And maybe you face it and you see it, but you're not condemned, right? And you're not, you're not justified through your actions, but you're also not condemned because of your actions. Under law, under law, you want to justify yourself through actions or karma? You want to justify yourself through actions? Go ahead. I can see why people would say you'd have to reincarnate, 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 reincarnate. Because did you actually die once? I know what. I'll tell you what. If there was reincarnation, I'm, and I, I, I hate to get you guys all disturbed. Oh, what do you mean if it's not it? I'm just, let, let's just pretend for a second. Let's just pretend for a second if there was that you come back and do this over again. But the Bible says it's appointed once for man to die. You just read it. Yeah, but also explain to me Lazarus then. Explain to me all the saints. I'm not saying there is reincarnation. I'm just saying then explain those things as well. Explain them. But maybe to die once is actually to die to that old way of thinking, that old way of thinking, where you thought you had to do something to earn favor, to earn love, to earn righteousness, to earn a good slate, because that's what you were taught. And that sounds very reasonable. But you know what? You got to weigh the good with the bad then. You got to weigh all of it together right? You got to bring in everything together. And you got to remember, if you only thought the thought once, according to scripture, you already did the bad thing because you thought about it. You looked at another woman that was married. She's a married woman and you were looking at her and you had that little tiny bit of desire in you. You didn't just look at her and say person over there. You were like, ooh. And Yeshua said, you already committed that thing in your heart. Right? That's pretty powerful to say. Every angry thought, every vicious thought you had about somebody else, knowing that just through your thinking that makes you a murderer, and now you want to justify yourself through karma, through works, through law, then that's up to you. I don't make Yeshua a religious thing. Yeshua is Jesus. I don't make him a religious figure or a religious thing or anything like that. I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to trust that. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him that he took it all for me. He fulfilled those laws. All the laws, the regulations, the commandment. He fulfilled it all for me. And he gives me that fulfillment as a, as a free gift. And if I die to my old self that says I have to live under that stuff and I am alive in him, the fulfiller of it all, that makes me a fulfiller of it all. Even though I didn't do one thing to fulfill it, all I did is say I do to him like a marriage, a covenant. I do. I accept it. Right? And now 
I don't have to live under any fear or condemnation at all. Fear of judgment? Not at all. Because the judgment already came. And I already died once. And then the judgment? Well, I did die once. And my sins, my, 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 my separation, my not being perfect, my, every, everything I did that hurt anybody else, all my self-righteousness, it's all been taken care of because Yeshua took it on himself and gave me an innocent verdict. Now, that's something that I am so thankful for. And that's something that I choose to believe. And you don't have to. I'm not saying you better choose like me. I'm just sharing why I believe why I believe. And I'm sharing some things that I've learned from scripture and how it backs it up. And hey, if you want to believe it too, cool. If not, cool. That's up for you, right? We're all on our own journey. We're here to learn something. But you know what? You can you can go in the direction of of the hive mind right where you think like like the majority or you can tune into that little narrow path that yeshua was talking about it's not broad and spacious and the majority goes that way it's a narrow path and it's difficult but it's the path to life the true life right and that true life will lead you to dying to yourself Dying to that old self, that old identity, that old belief system, and fully walking in his grace. Walking in justification, walking in love, and realizing who you are. That's an important thing. Figuring out who we are, right? Who are you? Do you know? That's, that's what I care about, you guys. Knowing who I am. Because if Yeshua lives inside of me, then knowing me would be to know him. Because my identity is in him. My life is in Christ. Right? And with Christ, I'm hidden in God. <laughs> that's amazing. Hidden. Hidden. Meaning like there's the, the, the enemy, there's like a veil over me, protecting me. Because my life is hidden. Can't touch me. Can't take that life from me. It's hidden. He can't dig it up. He can't, he can't take it. My life is hidden. Enemy can't take my spirit. Right? Can't take my spirit. That is God's. And so is my soul. All right, guys, I love you. I hope this has blessed you. I hope you have a great one. And I'll talk to you next time.